Well, I'd like you to look at Psalm 3 with me. We're going to do something we have never done at Denton Bible. We're not going to preach through the Psalms because there's 150 of them. And that's about three years worth of preaching. But we're going to preach through and just take a look at what are called the Psalms of Sorrow. Now, let me tell you what they're about. In the 150 Psalms that we have, uh, there are Psalms of adoration that just glory in the person of God. There are Psalms of thanksgiving that look at the benevolent acts of God, both to His creation and to the nation of Israel. There are what are called prophetic psalms, Psalm 2, Psalm 110, Psalm 45, Psalm 72, that look at the coming of Messiah, the hope of the world. There are psalms that are penitential psalms, when the authors found themselves in deep sin, and they're how men confront fallenness. And then there are psalms that are called imprecatory psalms, and that is where you call down the judgment of God upon the enemies of the nation. And then there are the Psalms of Sorrow, and they are the Psalms written in the first person about a fellow, usually David, that has found himself in circumstances and often circumstances by his own doing, that there's no plan B. You ever been there where you're in a cul-de-sac and God is going to take you through the valley of the shadow? They are very gritty, sweaty dirty psalms. You, you get the psalmist pain all over you. They're not deep theologically. It's just, you know, where you, the, the old saying, misery loves company. And you get the company of the man after God's own heart going through hard times. They're very emotional. They're joyful. There's pain. There's grief. There's despair. There's doubt. There's fear. All of the emotions that we go through. And they're very popular. They're the most popular of Psalms because I know when I went through a depression about 13 years ago, I would visit with certain people and I'd say, tell me you've been there. If, I, if they, you hadn't been there, I didn't want to talk to you. But if you'd been there, talk to me. And then I would say, tell me I'm going to make it. And they would say, you're going to make it. And that's what the Psalms of Sorrow are. It is the author saying to the reader, I've been there and you're going to make it. Uh, they're like a local anesthetic. You ever had one of those? Where you get a certain area and you put that patch on. And that's what the Psalms of Sorrow, they're Novocaine, they're, they're Lidocaine. They go right to the problem and they deal with it. Book of Romans, you deal with the entire worldview of reality and it strengthens you. The Psalms of Sorrow are immediate helps usually when you're raising children, all right? And they are challenging to the reader. You look, when the psalm starts, you go, I've been there. When the psalm ends, you say, I don't think I've been there. I need to get there. And so they're models of how to run the race that is set before us. A good way to look at them is like this. Psalm 1 is the alpha of the psalms. Blessed is the man who doesn't walk in the counsel of the wicked, his delights the law of the Lord. He'll be like a tree planted by streams of water. The wicked be like shaft the wind blows away. The wicked will not stand in the assembly, the assembly of the righteous. Different men, different choice, different path, different destination. That's Psalm 1. Psalm 2 is your leading prophetic psalm. That's the ultimate destination of the sojourner. Uh, why are the nations enraged against the Lord and His Messiah? He that sits in the heavens laughs at them. Uh, they, uh, what does it say? Kiss the sun lest you perish in the way. God has installed His King uh, in Jerusalem, His throne. It's the ultimate destination of man the judgment of God before the Messiah in His kingdom unto heaven. And so that is Psalm 2. It's the omega of the Bible. Psalm 1 is the alpha of choices. Psalm 1 is Eden, choices. Psalm 2 is Revelation 20, the final destination. In between are Psalms 3 
through 50. I'm 150. And they're the sojourner that makes those choices. The, have y'all discovered yet that our salvation, even though it's complete, is not yet fully experienced? Are you with me? Would anyone like to spend eternity in Denton? <laughs> it's on the right place, but I don't think so. Now, our salvation's finished, but we're not there yet. Like Israel is redeemed from Egypt, they're going to Canaan, Exodus, Joshua. But in between is the valley of the shadow of death that God takes you through. And that's where we are. We've gone from the blood of the Lamb to the throne of the Lamb, and in between there's the veil of tears that we all go through. Nobody gets a pass. We all go through it. Well, with that bit of encouragement, let's take a look at Psalm 3. If you look, the psalm, as in most of the psalms of sorrow, uh, it has a superscription. You see where it says above the psalm, a psalm of David when he fled from Absalom, his son? That's not put there by the English commentator. That's not put there by Dr. Ryrie in the Ryrie Study Bible or C.I. Schofield in the Schofield reference. That's in, in the Jewish Bible, the Hebrew Bible, that's verse 1. And so this is inspired. It lets you know the circumstances that this guy is in. A Psalm of David when he fled from Absalom his son. No one in this room has ever been to the low point of Psalm 3. Uh, David had a son named Amnon who raped his half-sister named Tamar. David didn't do anything about it because when you have cheated on your wives and conceived a child in Bathsheba and sent her husband to his death, it's hard to rebuke a man after you that has done immoral sin. So David lets it slide. He had a son named Absalom that's the full brother of Tamar. And Absalom didn't let it slide. Absalom murdered Amnon, his half-brother. David didn't do anything about that. Absalom fled the country, and he came back, and David received him back. And the bitterness went deep in Absalom. And so what he did was he stationed himself at the gates of Jerusalem. And for two years, when anybody would come to the king or his court for a ruling, Absalom would catch them before they went in. And he would take them by the hand and refuse to let them bow before him. He acted all humble. And he would say, oh, that somebody would appoint me judge. Your case is good and right. I hadn't heard it, but it's good and right. And if it were me, I would take care of this. And he did it for two years. And he won over to himself, probably the next generation that did know about the greatness of David previous. Can that ever happen where a nation of teenagers rebels? And so they did. And in time, Absalom had a coup planned. And he located men throughout Israel. And at a certain time, they would sound the ram's horn. And they would say, the kingdom is now Absalom's, Absalom is king. And so, all the nation, probably the younger, rebelled and followed Absalom. Was he a great man? No, but he had great hair. <laughs> and he drove a great chariot. All right. Sounds stupid. It can happen. And so, David looked around, this is in 2 Samuel 11 and following. And he said, Absalom's going to kill the city of Jerusalem and everybody in it. And so to protect them, he took all of the faithful that followed him and he led them out of Jerusalem, went weeping up the Mount of Olives. Does that sound like another king that wept on the Mount of Olives because of betrayal? And then on the top of the Mount of Olives, he waited for somebody to bring him back word. Would the nation follow and would Absalom try to kill him? And the word came back. He's going to kill you. And David led them into the wilderness. The guy that went over to Absalom to engineer the rebellion 
a rebel, uh, an engineering that was refused by arrogant Absalom. His name was Ahithophel that was one of David's best friends. And the reason that he rebelled against Absalom is that Ahithophel's granddaughter was named Bathsheba. And so the nation as a whole, a massive coup results. Have you ever felt unappreciated? Not like this man. Have you ever felt unappreciated? And so he says in verse one, how my adversaries have increased. Many are rising against me. Many are saying to my soul, I'll say he had adversaries. He had been rejected by the nation. He had been rejected by Ahithophel, his counselor. He'd been rejected by Judah, his home family. And he had been rejected by his own son, whom he had forgiven for murdering his other. And so David is at the lowest place that you can be. And what was worse is David knows in the back of his mind that he brought this on himself. That whenever he did his stunt with, with Bathsheba and Uriah and sent her husband to his death, God said, the sword will not depart from your house. You are forgiven, but there's going to be some repercussions come down. Y'all remember a guy when David was leaving Jerusalem, going out to the wilderness named Shemai, who walked alongside David. He was a descendant of, of the uh, Benjamites, the tribe of Saul. And he called after David, God has judged you, you man of bloodshed, you wicked man. Because he felt like he rebelled against King Saul and put him to death, which was false. And David had a buddy named Abishai that said, hey, not Abishai, Benaiah. He said, let me take this dog's head off. I just said, thank you, Jesus. You know what David said? No, God may have appointed him to curse me. I may need a good cursing. And so have you ever found yourself in a position of deep emotional pain where you are physically in danger and you know that you had something to do in bringing it on yourself. Well, that's where David is. This is his deepest pain. And it happened at the time of his greatness. Daniel, I'm sorry, 2 Samuel 7, 8, 9, and 10 are called by scholars Israel's Camelot, David's greatness. And then in 2 Samuel 11, it was the spring when kings went out to war and David stayed at home and behold, a woman was bathing next door ad infinitum. It happened. And so this is at the height of his greatness. A nation rejects him. And what hurt worse was verse two. Literally the Hebrew says, many are saying to my soul. They're like hollow point bullets going off. They're saying, quote, there is no deliverance, or the Hebrew says, there is no salvation for him in God. God has rejected you. This is all because of what you did that this is coming down on you. Uh, and I'm sure they said that because number one, his circumstances were out of control. He has no hope. The only hope he's gonna have is that they go to war and Absalom gets his hair caught in a oak tree and, get, and gets put to death. Somebody just laughed out loud. Yeah, yeah, yes. That's the only way he's going to make it. And that's just what happened. Uh, and also that this is a divine judgment because of what you did and bringing this on yourself. Y'all remember another fellow in the Bible that they said of him as he was dying? He hoped in God, let God deliver him if he delights in God. Who are we talking about? Jesus said the same things. And so if you've ever found yourself in a position that you're in a cul-de-sac, that there's no plan B, that God's going to get you out of it, and you have the knowledge that you wouldn't perhaps be here if you hadn't messed up three and four times with Bathsheba, Uriah, Amnon, Absalom, you messed up. And you created this. And so no one here has been where this man is. It's kind of like in the New Testament, nobody has been where another king was that was sold out by his nation 
and by Judas. And so, in verse 3, we're going to walk through how David gets out of it. I hate preaching where you enumerate number one through seven, and especially where you give it an alliteration. But I'm going to give you seven things that I'll start with the letter P right here (laughs) and show you how David goes through this. This text and the songs of sorrow have no great theology to them. They are just intense practicality. The text falls apart like roast beef. You don't have to press it. It's there in front of you. And so in verse 3, if you want to put down the word perspective, this is David's view of what is happening to him. He says, but you, O Lord. When he says, but you, that means no, you know, circumstances are this, the voices around me are this, my conscience is this, my reason says this, but you. O oh Lord, are a shield about me. You are my protection. I am not forsaken by you. Even if something happens to me, it is within your purpose. Do y'all believe that? Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, Satan has demanded to sift you like wheat. But I've prayed for you. Why did Satan demand permission? Because Satan can't act independently. Is there a book in the Bible where Satan can't get close to a man unless God lets him, and he can't touch his body unless God lets him? Who are we talking about? Job. Satan demanded permission to sift you. The demon said, Jesus, don't cast us into the abyss. Please cast us into those pigs. They are under his beck and call to serve his purposes. Satan's demanded permission to sift you like wheat, but I've prayed for you. Prayed what? That the thing won't happen? No. That once you've repented, that you will be able to rise up and strengthen your brothers. Peter, you need to go through this. And I'm going to limit how far it will go. Your faith will not fail. And after you've repented, you're going to strengthen your brothers. I'm going to make you a better man. And you're going to have Satan to think, because I'm going to be there controlling all things. Is that comforting? Never, ever will God forsake us, even if he puts us through things that we need to go through that he doesn't tell us about. And so he says, you're my shield. And then he says, you are my victory. You're my glory, the one who lifts up my head. He's thinking back, I'm sure, on Goliath. God took care of him. Saul, God took care of him. When Abner led a rebellion, God took care of him. When the Philistines rose up against him, God took care of him. When the men of Keilah betrayed him and the men of Ziph betrayed him, God took care of him. When he did stupid at Keilah and lied to that Philistine king that he would protect him and ended up almost losing his army, that God took care of him. And so he is saying, God, you protect me. And you're the one that gives me victory. That's what it means to lift up my head. In other words, the perspective, you ready? David, in light of all the voices around him, he knows the truth in the light of lies and error. There's going to be a time in your Christian life, if you hadn't faced it yet, that theology is going to get you through. That you're going to rest in God. Don, how long did you take care of Jerry that was in the ICU? Two and a half months with leukemia. You ever had to be in an ICR for two and a half months with your husband? I say this because uh, I was there with Don watching that. And uh, did theology get you through? The grace of God. God is in control. And there's a time that that happens to all of us. I know when I went through that depression, Teresa and I would get out and she would drive and I would sit next to her hoping for death. (laughs) That's how I felt. I was courageous. (laughs) And we would drive out Bonnie Bray out in the country. And some guy out Bonnie Bray, and as you looked at at his land and all that he had done, 
he had in wrought iron on the fence where everybody could read it as you looked on the veranda of what he had and it said, God is good. And it's in wrought iron. It ain't going nowhere. And we would drive by it and Teresa would say, God is good. And I would in refrain say, all the time. (laughs) And then she would say, all the time. And I would say, God is good. Dead gummit. (laughs) And I, now I drive by it and I go, God is good. I made it through that. Even made a film about it, made a load of dough. (laughs) There's money in anxiety. There really is. (laughs) And you know what? God took me through that. And so that's the number one thing when you go through pain. I remember Howard Hendricks once saying, he said, I know Christians who get better, get bitter when they miss their turn in a revolving door. (laughs) And David goes through facing death. Jesus is looking at death and says, into thy hands, I commend my spirit. And he died. And so you have perspective, the compass, due north, a north star. I know where you are, all right? I remember one time flying with a guy out in Florida. You ever heard of vertigo? When you're socked in and you have no point of reference. And I just knew we were flying upside down into the water, okay? And I looked at the guy next to me and he had on one of them pilot's hats with the little flaps coming down like this, you know. And he was just smiling. And I said, do you know we're about to die? And he said, nope. And he looks at his instrument panel. He said, your inner ear is lying to you. We're straight ahead. And I said, well, fantastic. <laughs> This is what happens, incidentally, before they give you your pilot's license, you have to get an instrument rating, because if you listen to how you feel, you ever heard of John Kennedy Jr.? That's what happened. He couldn't read the the instruments, and he went with how he felt, and then it's too late when the clouds break. And so David has perspective. Number two... David says in verse 4, I was crying to the Lord. Write down the word prayer. It's what you do when you can't do anything else. David prayed. I was crying. It's impassioned. It's in the imperfect. I was crying, meaning that it's continual prayer. Why do you pray continually? Well, put down another P word. Put down the word patience. You don't get to pray and have instant answers. That's called Aladdin's lamp and the genie. God isn't a genie. The Bible's not a lamp. And God doesn't answer prayer immediately because his goal in our life, and I hate this, but his goal in our life is not for us to always be happy. Have you all discovered that? It's for us to be great. Tom Landry once said that my job is to make these men do what they don't want to do, that they will attain what they are desperate to attain. I make them do the things day by day that will make them great. God doesn't just want us to be happy. If you'll remember, Aladdin's genie about destroyed him by giving him what he wants. How many in here have raised children? How do you raise a kid? You give him what he wants as soon as he wants it, right? No, that's when you're going to have to put him down like old Yeller after a while. (laughs) All right, don't email me because when you see those kids, you're thinking, boy, you better get on him quick. No, a child has to be raised in greatness by discipline. And so David cries out and he is crying And it takes time. Prayer demands faith because God isn't a genie. And when you start praying, the wheels of providence begin. But you don't get to see them. 
When you go home, read the only book in your Bible that the name God is not mentioned. Esther. Israel finds himself in a place of certain death, of genocide, of a holocaust, of a crazy guy named Haman. And they call off everything, everybody fast, and they pray, and you don't see answers. But you watch the providence of God, and when it's all said and done, there's an ending to the book that if somebody did it in a movie, you wouldn't believe it. Even Hallmark, you wouldn't believe it on how God comes from nowhere to arrange circumstances. And by the end of the book, God's name still isn't mentioned, but he's everywhere. And so David prays, and in verse 4, he answered me from his holy mountain. God heard the prayer, and the answer began, but you don't see it. After you read the book of Esther, I want you to sit down and read Psalm 18 on how David offered up his prayer. And in Psalm 18, it is written at the end of David's life, when David is recounting what made him what he is. And he talks about being in a place where he prayed. And as soon as he prayed, he takes this picture of God, and it looks almost like Jupiter casting his thunderbolts, coming to his aid. As soon, he said, as he prayed, that God, that smoke came from the nostrils of God. And the, the wheels of providence began, but they take a while to get there. And so prayer demands faith. You remember a guy that prayed that it would not rain upon the earth for three and a half years? And it didn't. Who are we talking about? Elijah. And then there was repentance and Israel put, put to death the false prophets. And so he knew that God would give rain and he prayed again that it would rain. And you know what? It didn't come. So he prayed again, and it didn't come. And he prayed again, and it didn't come. And he prayed again, and it didn't come. Then he prayed again, and it didn't come. And then he prayed again, and it came. And he sent his servant out to say, is it raining yet? And he said, no, but I see a cloud big as a man's hand on the east coming. I think he saw the storm, but it was so far away. And it's coming. And Ahab said to, I'm sorry, Elijah, Elijah said to Ahab, you better get out your umbrella and you better get your chariot in the garage. I just threw that in there. That isn't really in there. <laughs> and you better get home because there's a thunderstorm coming. And it came. And so, with that observation, James, in James 5, Jesus' little brother, said, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much for Elijah. And that's his illustration. Seven times, and then you just keep praying. Are you with me so far? In the light of pain, there is perspective, there is prayer, there is patience. And then, verse 5, you have peace, even though the answer isn't here. What do you do? Verse 5, you take a nap. I have a t-shirt that said, Jesus took naps, and so do I. <laughs> because he does. And so, I lay down, am I the only one here that is almost 70 that has to fall asleep at 3 o'clock? Does anybody have to happen? Debbie, do you sleep at 3 o'clock? You, you work. What are you saying? You're working. What, what am I doing? Am I, am, I, am I a juggler or something like that? Okay. And you're not 70. Oh. You do. Thank you, Vicky. Yeah, at three o'clock, I'm down. I'm gone. I never had to do that before. That was what old people do. I lay down and slept. The Hebrew says, as for me, I lay down and slept. As for me and my house, we're going to take a nap. <laughs> I lay down and slept. Who else in a great storm in the back of the boat took a nap? Jesus. 
uh, who, when he was surrounded by guards waiting to go out the next morning and die, took a nap in a prison? Simon Peter, Acts 12. He went to bed. He had learned from Jesus. David said, in peace I will lay down and sleep, for thou alone, O Lord, doth make me dwell in safety. When I was in high school, when I was a sophomore, I had a Sunday school teacher at Herring Avenue Methodist Church, and his name was Wayne Gardner, and he coached at Waco High, and I still remember, I didn't listen much in Sunday school, but I, when he said, he said he was in World War II, and he said there were some times, and he was just a good old boy from, where was it, Itasca, Texas. Anybody know where Itasca, he was from Itasca, Texas. And he said, in the war, I knew that the next day I might die. I knew that that night I could die. And so he said, I would simply say, God, I know where I'll be. I know where I'm where I need to be right now, doing my duty for God and my country. And he said, I would lay my head against the edge of the ditch and give my heart to God and I'd go to sleep. I never forgot that. Martin Luther said that his hero in the faith was the sparrow in the nest outside his window. He said the little sparrow awakes in the morning, he gathers his food, he comes back to his nest, he sings his heart out, and then he puts his head under his wing and goes to sleep. That was Martin Luther's mentor. And so the next morning in verse five, I awoke. The Lord sustains me. This is the classic verse that goes like this. Be anxious in nothing. The word anxious in Greek, it's pronounced like merimna, and it means in Greek all directions. When you're in trouble and you're looking around, the psalmist said, do not anxiously look about for I am the Lord and I will sustain you and uphold you with my righteous right hand. And so when Paul is in prison in Philippi, he and Silas are doing something. Their hands are in stocks. What are they doing? They're singing. Singing what? Louis, Louis. <laughs> Wrong. They're singing the Psalms of the faithfulness of God, and the jail fell down. And so David is simply singing. Psalm or Philippians 4, 7, be anxious and nothing, but in everything, prayer, specifically supplication, thanksgiving, God is in charge, let your request be made known to God, and the peace of God. Now, they knew Paul was writing that from a Roman prison. If you studied history, you know about the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome. And that was the edict that no one could challenge the Roman Empire at any place. In the Roman Empire, you, if you held a guy up on the road, you had to answer to the centurion. And they would fix you. And that was called the peace of Rome. Paul said, be anxious in nothing but everything, prayer, supplication, thank you, because no, no, God. And the peace of God uh, that surpasses all comprehension because it doesn't make sense. Dawn, did you have peace when Jerry was waiting on death? God was in charge. The peace of God that passes rationale. When Paul and, Bar and Silas were singing, it said everyone was listening to them. What are they doing? They're singing. Now, see, if that had been me, they'd have said, is he dying? <laughs> no, that's a song. Oh, okay. They're singing. It passes comprehension. Why are you in distress, O oh my soul? Trust in God. You will again praise him. Don't worry. And then it said, it will guard your hearts and minds. It's the Greek word for phalanx that was uh, the means of warfare by Alexander the Great. That you've got a guard around you the Roman guards in prison, but he said there's a guard bigger than that. Y'all remember a time in your Old Testament where Elisha got up and there was a pagan king 
that couldn't do anything because Elisha always knew what he was going to do. And he kept sending word ahead. And one of his servants said, it's that dang prophet. He said, he hears what you're saying in the bedroom. And the king was smart. If we're going to whoop Israel, we better kill that prophet. And so they surrounded Elisha's house. And his servant went out to brush his teeth. I just threw that in there. Okay. And there were soldiers everywhere. And he said, oh my God, to Elisha. Elisha said, chill. God opened his eyes. Let him see what he doesn't see. And around the armies, there were chariots of fire. God is with you. Incidentally, that became a very famous movie. And it was about a, a Congregationalist minister's son named Eric Little, who trusted in God completely. And that's why they called the movie about him Chariots of Fire. He had a means of support no one could see. Well, God will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. He's there. So, as David has got perspective, as David is praying, as David is patient, as David is peaceful, evening, morning, God sustains me. God is taking David through this one day at a time. Amen? God takes you through it one day at a time. One of the girls on our staff went through breast cancer a couple of years ago. And I said, now that you're, in a sense, clear, what have you learned? And you know what she said to me? I miss the closeness. She said, God drew near to me. When I needed him, he drew near to me. She said, I miss the closeness. Y'all ever heard of Corey Ten Boom? She got on a train. Well, she asked her father about difficulties that were rising in their day in Holland. Thank you, Adolf, and all the stuff that was happening. And the father said, Corey, whenever we're on the train and the conductor comes to you for your ticket, when do I give you the ticket? She said, when the conductor asks. And he said, that's God. You're okay because I've got the ticket, but I'm not going to give it to you until you have to have it. And he said, that's God. You just go and ride. When you got to have it, God will be there. Well, she found that out. That's why they made the movie, The Hiding Place, because God was there for her. And he'll do that. Incidentally, this is the way you get to know God. Be careful when you say, Lord, we just desire to know you. Dangerous prayer. Because he's not going to throw woofle dust on you. No, he's going to measure out your life. Aren't you glad he doesn't do it continually? He does it in lurches where he strengthens us. That's the way you get to know God. He that obeys my word, he it is that loves me. And he that loves me will be loved by my Father. We will draw him close. And I will love him. And I will disclose myself to him. It's the Greek word epiphany. He's going to discover God because he's going to be in a place where he has to rely upon me. Well, in verse 6, after peace... One day at a time, you have what is called perseverance. David has resolved. Verse 6, I will not be afraid of 10 thousands of people. Song of Solomon says, thou art the fairest of 10,000. Of 10 thousands of people who have set themselves against me. David is watching the army of Absalom come out against him. Incidentally, little story. Remember I told you about Ahithophel? Ahithophel went to Absalom and said, look, don't go destroy everybody's with David. People are not going to like that. Let me go and kill David. 
The return of everybody that's with him depends on the death of this one guy. Let me go get the guy that did wrong to my granddaughter's husband. Let me have him. And Absalom said, I don't know. And then David's friend approached. What was his name? So-and-so that is the king's Uriah. Go read it. He approached Absalom and played to Absalom's arrogance. Don't let Ahithophel go kill David. You go at the head of an army and you destroy every human being with David. And then you take the cities that look after him and you drag them to the ground. And Absalom said, yeah. And as soon as he headed off, Ahithophel went and hung himself because he recognized this boy was following his ego and he was a dead man. Isn't that interesting? What's that got to do with the song? I have no idea, but it was just a great story. I will not be afraid. David looked at that crowd out there and he said, I will not yield, not just to voices. I will not yield to fear. Does it get scary? Dawn, was that a little bit scary? For two months, staying right there at Jerry's side. That's scary. Vicky was having a fall and a bleed out that came. Was that kind of scary? It's always scary. But you don't listen to fear. That's what courage is. C-O-U-R means the heart. Coeur d'Alene, the heart of the lion. Courage means you have a great heart. Who is the guy who said, courage is being scared to death and saying, saddle up. Isaiah, John Wayne. <laughs> Solomon said, if you're faint in the day of distress, your strength is limited. Fear can cancel out potential. How many of you guys ever played football with some guy that looked like Tarzan, played like Jane. <laughs> See, you just can't be strong in the weight room. When the lights come on, that's when you got to have what's called game. That's when you got to rise up. Winston Churchill went through that dilemma. What was that movie that just came out with? Darkest Hour. Darkest Hour. I watched that on a flight home. I didn't even know how I got home. I just looked up and I was there. Churchill, knowing that the Nazis were 19 miles away across that channel, and they were coming, should I concede? And he went down on the English rail system and talked to common men, and they said, let's go to the death. Let's go to the death. And that's when he got up and made his famous speech. We will fight Hitler on the shore and in the city. And the place came to their feet. They asked him how he did that. So courageous when he was scared. He said, I was scared, but I determined to act as though I were not. And that's courage. I will not yield to what I feel. Deborah, march on with strength. Oh, my soul, screw thy courage to the sticking place. Habakkuk, Lady Macbeth. Okay. <laughs> Bill Shakespeare. And sometimes you just have to do that. Nope. I am going to press on. If I die, then I will die. Why? Because in verse 7, this is called protection. Arise, O Lord. All of a sudden, he is there. Save me, O my God. You have smitten all my enemies on the cheek, and you have shattered the teeth of the wicked. All you can do is sometimes you keep a clear conscience and you be faithful, you pray, you trust, you be fearless, and you wait. And this is the hardest thing of the Christian life, is being in the right, suffering, not yielding to voices, to reason, or to fear, and keeping on in your path. David knew it was not of God to have a coup and to kill him. He knew that. And so he clings to that right thing. 
and he just holds to it. That's his compass. And he will just wait on God. And the last thing is verse 8. Write down the word preach, or you can write down the word a pulpit. You now get to preach. He says, salvation belongs to the Lord. He's the one that is in charge. Do y'all know who else said that in a whale's belly? Jonah said that. That's called where you have no hope. Salvation belongs to God. He's the one that makes the call. And now, God, your blessing be upon your people. It goes from me to the whole nation. You know, I made a film, a four-hour deal on depression and anxiety because I earned the right because I'd been there. The woman that leads our prevail class against helping girls go through sexual abuse had had two sons that went through it, and she is there. Girl at uh, the gym that I work out at got to talking about some things of the heart once, and she talked about when she was, in, when she was young, she said, uh, got drunk at a party and found myself all of a sudden being raped. And she said, God took me through that. She said, I came around and God took me through it. And then she says to me, if you ever meet a girl that's going through this, you know where to find me. She's earned the right. She'd been through it. Uh, Diane Reed, that oversees our counseling ministry, has buried two husbands, one from a suicide. She's earned the right to counsel. God comforts us in any affliction that we might be able to comfort those in any affliction with the comfort by which we ourselves are comforted by God. And so God did the impossible, and now you preach. Let me just show you something. Uh, what's that? Hot dogs. Okay. They're on right down here. Let me show you something. In, in Genesis 43, I could paraphrase this. I want you to see it. In Genesis 43, do you remember when Joseph found himself as the prime minister of Egypt and his family back in Canaan had famine and they came to Egypt for food and Joseph longs to bestow the blessing of Egypt on that family, but he can't until those brothers come to admit their sin. And he brings them to that point. And what he does is he gets them all there that come for food and he calls them spies, your sinners. And they say, no, we're righteous men. We do happen to kill our brother periodically, but we're righteous men. He says, I want you to leave one of your brothers here. Simeon, tie him up. You got another brother back in, the, back in where you're from? Yeah. He knows who it is. His name is Benjamin. And he's the only other brother born of his mother, Rachel, and Joseph and that boy look alike. And he's never seen him, not as an older boy. He says, you got to bring Benjamin with you because he knows if I get that boy, I've got the family and I can get them all here and I can bestow blessing. So what was Joseph's ultimate plan to bestow blessing? What did the brothers think? He hates us. Can we do that with God sometimes? What did I do wrong? Just wait on me. And so he holds Simeon. He gives them bread, food in their donkeys. They go back home. Jacob looks up, their daddy, where's Simeon? The man kept him. He said, we can't have any more until we go back and we got to take Benjamin with us. You know what Jacob says in verse six? Jacob said, why did you treat me so badly by telling the man that you still had another brother? They said, the man questioned us particularly about our relatives saying, is your father still alive? Have you another brother? So we answered the question, could we know that he would say, bring your brother down here? They said, good night, daddy. It's almost like he has a, it's like he's one of our own family or something. They couldn't tell what was happening. Verse eight, Judah said to his father, send the lad with me and we'll arise and go that we can live and not die. We as well as you and our little ones. Look, I myself will be surety for Benjamin. You may hold me responsible for him if I don't bring him back to you and set him before you. Then let me bear the blame of you forever. Because if we had not delayed, Daddy, we'd have been gone and back twice. Daddy, you got you to trust God. Let us take our brother back. 
We're the chosen nation. Now, Jacob said in verse 11, the father said, if it must be so, dad, burn it. That's the Hebrew. <laughs> if it must be so, what that means is I have no plan B. It's either death or complete trust in God. I've got to like, take a cross up and follow him. And so, okay, if it must be so, question, have you ever been here to where if it must be so, then God, I will trust you. I have no choice. If I'm going to make it out of this alive, I'm going to trust you. Ever been there? Get ready if you hadn't. Well, he said, verse 11, let's, let's take some the best products back. Verse 12, take double the money back in your hand. Uh, verse 13, take your brother and return to the man. In verse 14, may God Almighty grant you compassion so that he will release you to your other brother and Benjamin. As for me, if I'm bereaved, I'm bereaved. If I lose every one of you, then that's the way it is. I'm going to have to trust you. Ladies and gentlemen, God is a master at bringing us into cul-de-sacs to where we have to trust him. I knew of a pastor one time whose wife said, your ministry is over. I am leaving you. And he said, look, give me another chance. I'll listen to you. She said, you never listen. He said, well, could you just wait? And he went out and fasted for three days, spent time on a mountain on the West Coast and just asked God for grace. And God restored him. He's a friend of mine. He told the story. His name's Chuck Swindoll. And God, whenever you hear Swindoll speak now, it's like a guy that itches where you scratch or whatever it scratch where you itch. He knows where you are. He knows where you are. Because he'd been there. And so this is the way you deal with pain. You just trust God. You got another minute? <laughs> I got a buddy named Bill Curry. He played uh, for the Green Bay Packers. He was an All-American linebacker at Georgia Tech. Played for the Green Bay Packers for Vince Lombardi. He was a center. He snapped to Bart Starr. Anybody? He snapped to Bart Starr. Then he got traded to the Baltimore Colts. And he played for Don Shula. And he snapped to Johnny Unitas, <laughs> my hero. And I said to Bill, he coached at Alabama. I said, man, you, you, got, you played for Barrett? For, no, for Johnny, what's his name? Bobby Dodd? You, you played for, for Shula, for Lombardi? Man, you got some stories. He said, listen. He said, and I said, what was it like to be a Christian? Because he was the head of the, he was a leader in the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. He said, when I went to, to Green Bay, as soon as I walked in the locker room, they knew I was a Christian. And Paul Hornig and Max McGee were in there talking. Paul and Max were the, the foils of Vince Lombardi. They think that he fined them like $50 million in the years that they were there. They were both single men. They were rowdy. And he kind of loved them like, like, you know, wayward sons. But he said, I walked in there and Paul Hornig grabbed me. Come here. And he walked me over. He said, you're, you're a FCA guy, aren't you? Yes, sir, I am. Look, here's McGee. And he said, Max McGee was sitting on a stool with a cigarette. He said, tell McGee he's going to hell. <laughs> he said, after we go out and do our stuff and chase around and drink, I come back and I go to the priest and I confess and I take communion. I take the mass. McGee doesn't. He claims it's hypocrisy. I want you to tell him he's going to hell. And so Bill Curry said, here I am standing with two Hall of Famers, future, and he wants me to tell him he's going to hell. And he said, I said, what'd you do? He said, I looked at Hornig and McGee and I said, well, I can tell you an answer, but it really doesn't matter what I say. The issue is that there's someone here that is bigger than all of us. And McGee said, I knew he'd bring Lombardi into this. <laughs> so
Sometimes there's just somebody bigger than all of us, and it's not Vince Lombardi that we have to answer to. Amen. Y'all ever sung this? Uh, Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. This grace hath brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. Amen. Yeah. Pray with me here. Father in heaven, we are thankful for this psalm. And there wasn't a lot of, wasn't a lot of theology here. It was just ugly. It dealt with us where we are. And sometimes we have to say, if I die, then I'll die. Like Esther. If I perish, I perish. But I'm going to trust God through this. And uh, David did not go into any more women. He knew that much. He was a changed man. But you took him through it. And Absalom was left hanging by his hair with three spears in him. And the, the rebellion was put down, and the nation repented. And David never even prayed it. It was over his head, but he did. And you'll take care of us. And Lord, as sure as I'm standing here, there's those of our church, me included, that will pass through the valley of the shadow. Thou art with me. Thy rod and staff comfort me. You prepare a table before me, even in the presence of my enemies. My cup overflows. Goodness, surely, and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And then I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen.